Well, I'm delighted to be here and thank you very much. And thanks to Simon for a wonderful introduction. So he's already said quite a bit of what I wanted to say. And um, I wish I could be there uh, in uh, uh, actually present in China. And uh, that was uh, unfortunately not at all possible. Anyway, let me go forward. Um, what I want to talk about here was actually a topic I was given rather than what I would have chosen. What does complexity or complexity economics have to do with technological progress? It was a really challenging uh, topic. Uh, I'd written a book about uh, technology but I hadn't really explicitly talked about complexity and technology together. So that's what I want to attempt to do here. Um, Simon said a moment ago, he didn't quite define complex systems, but he certainly alluded to them uh, as having multiple elements uh, create some overall outcome. I have to use my hands here and wave them around, they cause some overall pattern or outcome that those elements in turn react to. And this changes the, the outcome. Uh, and so circling back, the elements re-react to the changes and so on, and, th and this goes on. I'm getting a lot of, I'm getting a lot of, of interference. Um, and I, I okay. So multiple elements are causing some sort of outcome those elements are reacting to. Maybe a very, very simple example is to think of cars in a freeway or a road or a highway in traffic. Cars differ. They have different drivers, different speeds, different uh, behaviors, and they cause an outcome locally. The outcome is called local traffic. And those elements speed up or slow down or change their behavior, maybe change lanes, and this changes the outcome. And as Simon was pointing out, we're interested in the phenomena that emerge from this sort of recursive interaction, elements, outcomes, elements changing. Uh, there might be traffic jams in a case like this or other things that you would see. When you sort of think about the economy this way, and I'm maybe by this time I'm simplifying uh, dozens or maybe even hundreds of studies, we're typically interested in complexity economics in a whole, co the, the elements would be agents or agents behaviors, their beliefs or forecasts, maybe these agents have different strategies, possibly different actions, and they can choose and re-choose these. So maybe they're in some market or in some joint situation, and they're reacting to the outcome that they are mutually or together creating. And, and once again, um, I'm sorry, I can't talk if there's, if I'm just getting positive feedback echoes. Uh, okay. So how does the whole, uh, so in complexity economics, uh, can you do something about this please? Hello? Professor Arthur, you are hearing some echoes in your ear, uh, ear, earphone, yes. right? Yes. Okay. So he's. Uh, okay. 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 Well, let me try. No, this is this is not working.
want to make me one of my Okay, so uh, um, uh, Professor, maybe you can try to tear your earphone out. We can hear hear you very clearly. Okay. Yeah. Try that. See if it's better. Can you hear yeah. me? Yeah. Yeah. Loud and clear. Can you hear us? Yes. Okay. Great. And shall okay. we continue? Okay. So okay. in general, okay. in complexity economics, we're interested in how multiple agents, very likely differing, are creating some outcome that they're reacting to. That may their reactions may change the outcome, and in turn. Uh, their behavior may adjust yet again, and it keeps going in a kind of causal loop like this. Uh, equilibrium in this kind of economics is not assumed. It's, uh, it's, uh, it, there may be an equilibrium that eventually emerges or quickly emerges, or there may not. So it's an ecology of beliefs or strategies that um, agents are reacting to. So the question here is, could you pose the same questions about technology instead of having agents react to some outcome they're mutually causing and changing their own behaviors as a result continually? What about if we think of a collective the whole collection of technologies used in the economy. And we start to ask, how would they react to, how would they build out, how would they uh, be rendered obsolete, given the overall economy that these technologies create. So again, you have your loop. In this case, technologies would be building out and creating an economy uh, that they would be reacting to, possibly bringing in further uh, technologies. So that's an overall question. It looks like a pretty complicated one, and I can assure you it is. Um, let me give you a quick illustration. I've connected technology with the economy. We tend to think of the economy as something that's given, and technology is contained in that. But I want to give you a very different illustration. This, uh, if your uh, Western audience may know this picture, it's uh, by John Constable, 1819. It's very much the rural economy in England. 1819 is the year that Queen Victoria was born, and she was born into an economy that had multiple technologies, you can see horses, you can see small boats, you can see ponds, you can see cattle at the watering hole, you can even see barns and houses and all the existing agrarian or agricultural technology of the day. Technologies changed. Mills came in, industry came in, so by the time Queen Victoria was about 40, this would have been around 1860, the economy had changed. And the economy, this is not exaggerating, I'm not sure where this is, it could be uh, Halifax or Manchester or Birmingham or somewhere like that, again in England, 40 years later. So what happened was very largely the result of technology. And you could say, not so much that the economy is a container for its technologies, which it is, of course, but the economy is really an expression. It emerges more than anything, I would use the word emerges from its technologies. It's not the only technology, it's not the only cause of an economy. There's uh, behavior, there's ideas, there's decisions, there's ideals. But more than anything else, technologies create an economy. That, by the way, isn't a new observation. Classical economists thought in those terms, and I would include people like J.S. Mill, and I would include, now I'm getting an echo. 
Can you do something about it? Please. Are you still here, Echo? Uh, uh, let me see. Yes. Do you still hear Echo? Yes. Uh, that's a bit better. No, it's not any better. Better? Nope. Okay, let me try that. The echoes disappeared again. Thank you. So what I was saying is that an economy really is not so much something that's bringing us technologies. It certainly is. An, eco an economy is something that's emerging from its technologies. Once you get all these technologies, mills, um, steam engines, whatever it is, that's driving this and all the smoke and all the horrors you see in the, in the economy that would have been familiar to people like J.S. Mill or Karl Marx or others at that time around the 1860s, you begin to see that an economy emerges from its technologies. And that was widely accepted in economics in those days. So the question I want to ask here is, if there is something we can call technology, the whole collection of means to human purposes, that's how I would define a technology, how does it build out? It's a question I started to ask seriously in 1995 or so, and about 12, 14 years later, I came out with this book, The Nature of Technology, What It Is and How It Evolves. Uh, by the way, the, the book has gone into two editions in China, two different translations, I believe, and I believe it's widely read in China. <laughs> I'm happy to tell you. So how does technology build out? If you look to standard uh, discussions of technology, actually the people in economic theory don't ask how does technology build out. Uh, it's taken always or pretty well always in standard economic theory that technologies are given. They just, they're standalone things, independent. They just sit there. How technology progresses, changes, evolves, is given over to economic historians who by and large, I think do a pretty good job of keeping up with that. So the first thing I want to say is technologies are not standalone affairs. They're highly interconnected. You get the impression in standard economics that technologies are few. There might be maybe a few dozen or a few hundred technologies. There's technologies for making concrete or for making ammonia or technologies for making steel, and so on. You also get the impression in economic theory that technologies don't last, which is correct. And sometimes they're slid out. So around 1875, the Bessemer process, that's slid out like um, some uh, type of insert into the machine and it slid out and a new technology slid in uh, the Thomas Gilchrist process, which was an improvement. Reality, I believe, is something different. So here's reality, technologies, and this is from a very lengthy, uh, many, many years of um, study on my part, plus uh, uh, at least two engineering degrees. So I'm not approaching this as an economist, but more as someone who is fascinated by technology. If you think of technologies as a collection of nameable means to purposes, they're highly interdependent. So one technology depends on others, which depend on many others, and they're highly interconnected. Technologies compete, meaning that uh, you might have multiple ways say, to generate electricity from renewables or from hydro uh, and so on. Technologies are mutually supporting. If you have some technology, uh, say like uh, AI, which figures in this conference quite a bit, 
it needs computation, it needs all sorts of software programming, neural nets and other technologies. Technologies tend to be fractal. So if you take something, any arbitrary technology like a jet engine, you can take it apart. Uh, you will see turbines, that's another technology. Take the turbines apart, there's turbine blades, etc. So technologies can be differentiated into smaller and smaller units that themselves are technologies. And each of these things, each of these new technologies offers itself as a building block for yet further new technologies. Once you've neural nets, you can create, uh, that's a building block for creating further AI that might be a further building block for creating yet other technologies. I want to mention three principles of technology um, that became apparent very early on. A technology is not conjured from nothing. A technology is assembled or put together, a new technology, as some solution created from technologies that already exist. Here's an illustration. This is a railway locomotive in the front. My guess is this is in England. My guess is it's probably 1831, 1832, looking at the state of the technology, very early days. Notice that the whole technology, which is a railway train, a train of carriages, has carriages. Uh, human carriages, they existed. It's on rails. Rails existed in mines. It has wheels um, already existed, levers, chimneys, a boiler, a steam engine, all of which are put together to create, in this case, a primitive train. So technologies don't form uh, from the ether, technologies form from uh, putting together existing technologies, sometimes having to develop further technologies that you need to uh, put together. As I keep saying, a technology may become a building block uh, which for further technologies. So I'm expecting GPT, chat GPT, or generative or large language AI to become a building block, say, within financial technology um, in many, many different applications. One other thing is that technologies demand out yet further technologies. Once you have horses, carriages, or cars, or automobiles that run on petrol or gasoline, that demands out need to refine gasoline, a need to ship gasoline, a need to explore uh, for further oil, crude oil, and things that will make gasoline. So technologies demand out other technologies. And all this leads me to the idea, and I'm taking a whole book here and <laughs> reducing it to one slide. So pardon if this is a, a little bit of a caricature. All of this leads to a sequence or algorithm, or if you want to call it a process, you can think if a new technology comes along, that sets forth a train of events over time. That's why I call this an algorithm. It's a series of steps. Imagine a new technology comes along. Well, the first, not the first thing it does, but it will certainly start to replace existing technologies. So once you get a railway locomotive plus a train, it starts to replace uh, canal transportation. It calls forth supporting technologies. So again, let me change the example here and say, okay, around 18, sorry, 1950, along comes the transistor. Doesn't look as if it's gonna be terribly useful for things, but it certainly starts to replace vacuum tube technologies. It calls forth supporting technologies for the manufacture of uh, transistors, which isn't easy, silicon methods, foundries for creating silicon, and eventually 
uh, for creating integrated circuits. It offers a building block, um, famously transistors are in just about every further technology, including computation uh, and uh, all the devices by the hundreds of thousands or maybe even millions by now, from your smartphone to uh, GPS systems. So transistors are uh, very much a building block and those um, building blocks are further building blocks. And this causes over time, and maybe in a subtle way, prices to shift in the economy, organization, uh, the economy to be reorganized. In fact, you know, the whole character of the economy to change. So you've got early on textile mills and steam engines, and that caused changes in the prices of obviously of manufacturing, the cost of manufacturing textiles, the way um, manufacturing was organized in England and other places, and the character of the economy changed. I don't, I, this is something of a caricature because there's other steps, there's other phenomena, but what I want to point out is one fairly simple thing here. And that is that this sequence I've just alluded to may not stop. In fact, you say a new technology comes in. Well, by step two, it may call forth supporting technologies. But those themselves are new technologies. So the algorithm here, if you want to call it that, is calling itself. Similarly, if a uh, new technology, think uh, GPS, uh, global positioning systems, that may be a building block and further navigational types of technologies that are just simply built in, or maybe for uh, aircraft navigation or drones or whatever. And then that's creating further new technologies. So a new technology doesn't just go through these four steps and stop. And then there's a new economy and everything kind of freezes in place again. This new technology calls forth other technologies and becomes a component in further technologies. So as I said, the algorithm calls itself. If you look at that and step back a little bit, this is basically what I'm doing is looking at the economy through the eyes of technology, rather than just looking at technology through the eyes of the economy. The economy that's when novel technologies come along, they bring in further technologies by this algorithm calling itself and you further new technologies. There's no reason that that algorithm once it gets going needs to stop. The economy continually then over time is recreating itself. None of this is instantaneous. None of these steps are instantaneous. They're all going in parallel. And they're happening not with one technology like the transistor, but with probably hundreds of thousands of technologies all at the same time at all scales, at all levels. It's probably a good place to stop and uh, sorry about the holdups on the audio side there, but what I'm attempting to say here, I hope uh, clearly and a little bit simplistically more than I would want, is to say that the economy emerges from its technologies, but that can call forth further technologies and it can introduce yet other technologies so you have technologies creating the economy, which is continually recreating technologies and thereby recreating itself. I declare that to be a complex system. Thank you very much.